Hello, everybody, um, and thanks, Dario, for the for the introduction. Um, I'm great to be here today. I think you have uh, you have names and 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 titles here on the slide. I will um, first of all uh, introduce um, the the um, um, other two speakers or participants really in this in this webinar. Um, emphasis is on participants because we'd like to keep this session as interactive as possible. Um, obviously. So um, um, I'll start um, um, with, uh, before I return to myself, I start with um, Gordon Guyatt. Gordon is a distinguished professor here in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University and um, the um, co-convener of the Cochrane Methods uh, um, group that focuses on grading, so the Cochrane Grading Methods group. Um, and um, you can see um, in the title and on this slide um, that, um, 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 grade um, as a method uh, is obviously key to this to this group, and um, Gordon is also the co-chair um, with me of the um, um, the grade um, working group that um, underpins a great deal of the work that we are that we are talking about today. And um, I'll I'll again I'll um, um, hand it over to to Gordon and um, Romina in a second to just show their webcams and and um, say additional words of introduction. Then um, Romina Bricknadella Peterson is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University, and um, Romina has been. Uh, involved with work uh, with the great working group for a long time, very much focusing on on issues around multiple intervention comparisons and network meta analysis that we will hear about more today. And as Dario said, not with us is um, Nancy Santeso, um, similar to Romina, has been involved with both Cochrane and the great working group for um, a really long time. Um, and uh, many of you will know her from um, teaching sessions around around grade and summary of findings tables in particular um, from the various Cochrane events that we've held. So perhaps we can just uh, ask Gordon and, and Romina to uh, um, turn on their, their camera for a second and um, say a few words of um, welcome. That would be great. And um, um, then we'll perhaps start, start our, our um, question session with the, with the um, um, people who are on the, on the panel. Okay. Gordon, you want to go? Yeah. yeah okay, sure. Uh, uh, Gordon Guyatt, thanks for the introduction, Holger, um, and delighted to, to be with you all today. Um, as one gets old, one have, may, may have a record for being with Cochrane, longest of the people here, and since I'm getting old, it's been a pleasure for many years. And Good morning, Romina? everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Holger, for the introduction. And, and thank you, Chris, Dario, and Ella for hosting the event. Um, happy to be here today. I um, I guess I'm the opposite. I'm the youngest, so the one that's been with Cochrane and, and grade the shortest. But uh, like Holger said, I focus on, on network meta-analysis. So I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions about that or anything else that I can be of help with. Great, um, thanks, Romina. So, so perhaps um, um, just to come back to the to some of the the uh, work that surrounds the Cochrane Grading Methods Group, um, um, without going through some lengthy uh, um, lengthy um, um, explanations, but um, the the brief background is really that. Uh, the great working group started its work its work in in the year 2000 um, the um, the year that I attended my first Cochrane symposium in Cape Town uh, South Africa uh, which was um, an absolutely great event um, at that time the um, Cochrane uh, grading methods group existed as um, um, or around that time as, as the applicability and recommendations methods group. And as uh, things evolved, it became very clear that the work that we did with the great working group um, was completely overlapping um, with um, the work of the applicability and recommendations um, uh, a methods group. And in the process of, of the reorganization of the methods group, um, that renaming also um, took place. And I think that's quite relevant for, for, the, for um, um, the, the session today 
um, as we, for instance, address our very first question, um, which is, um, you know, how to get involved with, uh, um, with the um, um, Cochrane Grading Methods Group. And the answer is quite, quite straightforward in, in my view, because of what I just said, the overlap um, that exists with the work of the Great Working Group. Uh, um, the, the, the best way to get involved is really um, to become a member of the Great Working Group and um, sort out um, through the work that we are de doing there what might be particularly relevant for you as a Cochrane as a Cochrane author. Um, and um, the, the, just to show that very quickly, I could actually uh, um, um, demonstrate this here by by showing my screen, um, which I will do in just a second. Um, this is actually our website for the Great Working Group, and I'll get back to the Cochrane Grading Methods Group um, um, website in just a second. But very straightforward, greatworkinggroup.org. You will actually you will actually see um, the um, 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 the the a lot of um, background information about Great that um, I think is extremely relevant for for anybody being involved in the in the actual Cochrane Grading Methods group. And down here, you see that um, get in touch and the contact. So um, to get listed um, on the Great Working Group um, 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 or get involved with the Great Working Group, um, that's the way to contact us. And then uh, um, about the, just um, a general, general um, reminder, obviously, there are the, the Cochrane Grading, uh, the Cochrane Methods Group websites. Um, that provide um, um, links to that as well, um, where you can go and find relevant information. So it's it's easy to get in to it's easy to get involved from our point of um, of view. Uh, and again, primarily through the websites, we maintain mailing lists um, that we um, use very sparingly to not overwhelm people with emails, but um, that provide that provide the the um, you know the relevant uh, um, relevant info. Um, Ella also. Uh, um, 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 posted a a, um, um, a link in the chat that um, will be work, um, worthwhile for you, and Chris did that as well. So you have these links there that um, I'm provided with the information that I just um, that I just um, I'm talked about. So I um, again uh, um, just by introduction, we want to make sure that we address your questions, and we had a bunch of questions submitted ahead of time. Um, one of them was actually how how to get involved, and I will address that second part of the question in in just a second, which focuses whether or not you need to be an expert methodologist to join. Um, but um, please, as a reminder, um, do put your do put questions in the chat, and um, um, you can also use Twitter for that. And I think you've been alerted to that. I will ask Ella and and uh, um, and Chris perhaps to. In the chat, put the hashtag that uh, will make it easy to reach us um, today, um, and just the, the Twitter information. Um, the second part of the question is, and I'll I'll um, then ask um, um, Gordon um, to chime in on that, and perhaps Romina to talk a little bit about her experience, how she got involved, and whether or not she felt that she was an expert methodologist when she first got involved with Grade. Um, the question is, um, do I need to be an expert methodologist to join? Um, great, uh, the great working group, and uh, I'm, I will from now on use this term synonymously with the Cochrane Grading Methods Group because of what I just said by the introduction, which is the complete overlap here. Um, the, the, the great working group, um, I think, justifiably prides itself by being open um, to really uh, any member at any stage of their career. And um, it's been interesting to see that, um, you know, over these um, two decades, people have moved from, from being an, an, an early uh, career methodologist to expert methodologists. And um, I think that provides you with the, with the answer that I would, um, that I would um, um, give to that particular question. Um, anybody can join. Um, obviously, we bring Different expertise and different uh, um, background to the to the table um, over the course of participating in in great great working group great work um, you um, may evolve into an expert in the in the field but the short answer is you do not need to be an expert um, again I'm just uh, I'm turning it over to 
to Gordon and Romina for any thoughts on that particular question? Um, yes. So um, there are two major reasons to join. One is to learn, and the other is to make active contributions. And the latter is not a necessity. So as Holger very correctly pointed out, you may come starting just to learn. And as you do learn, both through involvement and through all sorts of other ways you can learn in your Cochrane activities, uh, you may more and more have a chance to contribute. If your total uh, participation with us over years is simply sim as a learner, that is okay too. So absolutely no requirements for any expertise, and we welcome people who join us just to learn. And even if you join us just to learn, you can also contribute by asking good questions and pointing out to us where we might not be as clear as we should, because we work hard to be clear, but sometimes we may fail. So even if you are just there as a uh, to uh, to further your education, but are ready to tell us, hey, that's not as clear as it should be. That's a contribution. Great, thanks, Gordon. And for me, over to you. Maybe um, again, um, if you want to reflect how how that uh, path of your, you know, what the path of your career was was great. That would be fantastic for people to to hear, I guess. Great. Thanks, Holger. So, yeah, so I joined the great working group on my first year of graduate school, and I was a dentist, so I knew nothing about methodology. So I was very, very far from an expert methodologist. Um, so I was, it was my plan, but I wasn't um, close to it. Uh, and immediately I felt very welcome. I felt like every participant is, is very valuable, and my experience has been uh, incredible. Their learning opportunities in every meeting are um, immense and the more you learn, the more motivated you um, become to keep learning and to start contributing even more. And I believe that the, the rich diversity in terms of uh, the background of uh, expertise, in terms of methods, it's what actually keeps us grounded and, and keeps us in touch and oriented uh, to provide guidance and methods that are helpful for users and to communicate and write those uh, with the users in mind. So uh, by no means you need to be an expert methodologist. I was not, and you should definitely join us and help us because that's uh, very, very valuable to us. Thanks, Romina. Great. Um, um, so just uh, as, as um, as you're thinking about some um, questions and maybe reflecting on what was just said, um, um, I'll just add to that that um, the the obviously joining the great working group uh, um, um, has to do with some the entire processes that uh, great deals with, which um, both deal with the assessment of the certainty of evidence, um, as it is particularly relevant for systematic reviews, but also aspects around developing recommendations. And the reason why we why we feel that there is still um, relevance, despite the fact that uh, Cochrane reviews do not necessarily or shouldn't make recommendations, the reason why it's still relevant is, first of all, because the original name of the methods group um, included actually the term recommendation, but because it creates the the under, it creates a lot of, um, a better understanding of what decision makers actually need um, from their um, um, from or um, in the systematic reviews that we are producing in in Cochrane and systematic reviews standing for really any type of systematic review, be it prognosis, be it uh, be it a uh, um, test accuracy review, be it a um, you know a, a rapid review and so on. So um, great relevance there. However. Um, most of um, the work that a, a um, Cochrane review author um, would focus on, or most of the, the um, 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 most of the relevant work, obviously relates to creating summary of findings tables in um, um, Cochrane systematic reviews, and that includes the assessment of the certainty of the evidence, but also the whole structure around the, the summary of findings table that we are that we are. Uh, um, 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 
um, obliged to produce in, in our Cochrane reviews. And I will just um, quickly share one of these summary of findings tables, just so that you have a, uh, um, an idea of what I'm talking about. And then we can go to one of our first um, questions that was posed ahead of time, unless there are any questions in the, in the chat. While I'm pulling this up, I'm reminding you that um, the chat is there to, to do ask questions. Um, that is really the idea. Um, um, and um, um, you, can, you can just post them in the chat. And as Ella indicated, you can put them on Twitter. And is there, if they are coming, on, uh, coming in on Twitter, um, our colleagues will help us to address them. Um, so summary of findings table, just uh, to bring everybody to calibrate everybody um, who's here. There's about 96 people who are in attendance today. Um, and again, the first hour really focuses on just whatever questions you have around the, the actual methods group, um, not so much focusing necessarily on the methodology that comes later in the day. But the summary of findings table um, um, is essentially a synthesis and tabular format of the key findings of the review, quite different from an abstract. Um, I um, we like to quote um, David Toby, the former editor in chief of the Cochrane Library. He said, "When um, I have to um, speak about a Cochrane review, um, the first thing that I do is I look at the summary of findings table, which provides me with the key findings um, of that review and gets me informed um, quite quickly." So. Um, summary of findings tables are here, and one of the, the first question um, was um, primarily about whether or not the assessment of the certainty of evidence, which you see here, quality of the evidence, we also call that certainty of the evidence, um, um, whether or not um, the assessment of the certainty of evidence should be done for outcomes that are not listed in the summary of findings table. Um, two very quick responses to that. Um, the, the work that we've done um, quite early on on summary of findings tables suggested that um, summary of findings tables should not include more than seven um, critical or important outcomes. And um, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, it also um, probably highlights that it might not be necessary to, um, depending on, on what the review is for, how the review is used, it might not be necessary to um, actually do include any other outcome. If you do include other outcomes in your review, but not in the summary of findings table, um, the suggestion is to do that assessment of the certainty of evidence for any of the outcomes that you actually produce in the systematic review, even if you don't end up including them in the summary of findings table. That was one of the, again, was the first question. I'm just going to um, post this here. That way you know what this, um, what this question actually was. And then we, we do have a, a question in the, um, in the, in the chat. Um, and that may be a question that um, Romina wants to address. Uh, it's quite, it's quite um, um, focused. And Romina, it might be good to also refer to your session on network meta-analysis later. I don't know if you can see it. but um, um, and the very specific um, question is, do most network meta-analysis really embrace the transitivity assumption? Um, and again, we are jumping right into quite some detailed conversation um, with that. But um, it's good because we should address what people um, who are actually on the webinar um, would want to know about. And then, Ella, just for, for progress purposes, if you want to post that next, um, that next question in the, from Twitter in the chat, that would be fantastic. Thanks, Holger. And thank you, Jorge, for the question. And maybe just to quickly start and to bring everyone uh, to the same page, um, the first thing that I'm going to do is just to clarify that uh, in transitivity, or in great terms, intransitivity is one of the great domains that is specific to network meta-analysis. And this, is, uh, this was new and introduced as a new domain for uh, when, when great for network meta-analysis was uh, published back in 2014. And transitivity is one of the main assumptions that a network meta-analysis should uh, meet. And basically, it refers to uh, the validity of indirect comparisons. So for example, if we want to learn about how A versus B compare, 
And we are doing this through indirect evidence or a common comparator, let's call it C, then uh, this indirect comparison through C is composed of two pieces, the comparison between A and C and the comparison between B and C. And through this pathway, we get to learn about A and B. So transitivity basically refers to how valid it is to learn through this indirect evidence. And um, the intransitivity uh, is something that we assess when we address the certainty of the indirect evidence, which is one of the steps to learn about how or, or what is the certainty of network estimates. So um, the, the first point to make here is that if a network meta-analysis is well planned and the eligibility criteria are well thought of and it actually makes sense to put together all of these studies to learn about A and B in this case through both direct and indirect evidence, then it's very, very rare that there will be uh, glaring uh, issues about intransitivity. Unfortunately, intransitivity is a conceptual and theoretical uh, concept and it cannot be quantified. It's similar to risk of bias. Uh, some people think of uh, incoherence between direct and indirect evidence as sort of the statistical manifestation um, of intransitivity, uh, but it's not just all of that. So when ideally in a network, you should plan uh, your, your review and eligibility criteria and analysis in a way that there will not be intransitivity. That being said, you might have intransitivity, uh, and we do assess intransitivity for uh, every pairwise comparison in a network estimate. Whether uh, intransitivity will affect the conclusions uh, will depend on both whether the intransitivity is serious enough for you to rate down the certainty of the indirect evidence, and also will depend on to what extent that indirect evidence actually contributes to your network estimate. So if we go back to the example of A versus B, uh, you know you can learn about that from direct evidence and also from indirect evidence. So you might be in a case in which you consider there is serious intransitivity enough to rate down, but if most of your evidence for the network evidence uh, comes from direct evidence, then that intransitivity and the indirect evidence doesn't really matter much and it will not um, affect your conclusion about the, the network estimate. On the other hand, if all you have to learn about A versus B is indirect evidence and there is serious intransitivity to write down, that of course will affect your certainty of the evidence and the conclusions that you make. If intransitivity is serious and you rate it down one level, uh, it'll make the certainty of the evidence go down by one level. If you rate it down two levels, it'll make it go down two levels. So in summary, it depends on um, whether the intransitivity is serious enough to rate down and how much that indirect evidence contributes to the network estimate. I hope that helps and I'm happy to um, answer any questions by email as well uh, if this wasn't clear, but I wanna take all the time. Holger, back to you. Great, thank you, Romina. Um, wonderful. Um, I and again, um, Jorge, it may make sense uh, um, to to um, um, post another another example, um, um, or another question, Jorge, if, if there if you have follow up questions. I want to go to the to the next um, um, the next um, question that is just being posted in the chat before I go to Twitter and and the next question then. Important for you to get prepared would be one on imprecision. Um, there's two actually. Um, the the next question that is really in the chat here is is it um, um, thanks for organizing this event. Would it be possible to export um, some of your findings tables in other languages? Um, yes, um, there there are there is functionality for that um, within the the programs that um, um, that exist to create some of your findings tables as it relates to Cochrane reviews. As it relates to Cochrane reviews, the the they are obviously published in in English and and um, they are they are used in that particular in that particular language. So again, just to um, um, whatever tool you use to produce your summary of findings tables, there are functionalities to export um, tables in 
in other languages? That's a pretty straightforward and easy question. Uh, um, and then we'll we'll get to observational studies. I see a question from Becky Blair. I'd like to go to um, addressing a question around imprecision um, first um, before we go to um, issues around observational studies, if that's okay. And I'm going to post this in the in the chat as well for everybody that question about imprecision. Um, and there are indeed two Gordon to address. Um, one um, is part of the they are related. Uh, one is part of the pre-submitted questions that we had. As I said, I posted them in the chat. I will read them out as well, and then address the second one. Um, if I have um, um, the following results. Uh, um, and then there's a description of events, 13 events in 366 in, in individuals in the intervention group and seven in 133 individuals in the placebo group. And then there's a relative risk described with a wide confidence interval um, ranging from 0 0.27 to 1.65 and um, um, low certainty in the evidence um, downgraded for risk of bias and imprecision. And my first comment would be, um, would one weigh down by one level or two levels by imprecision? And that addresses the question on Twitter. Uh, um, should these results be interpreted as low certainty evidence that outcome um, um, that the outcome lower uh, is lower in people I suspect treated with the intervention compared to this placebo, or is it best to conclude there was no evidence of a difference? And the related question to that is. Um, um, it would be interesting to hear some discussion around when to downgrade twice for imprecision. And Gordon, if you want to um, take that question on first, and um, I'll have um, likely something to, to add to that as well at the end. Gordon, over to you. Okay, so um, it was 13 over 366 and 7 over 165, more or less, if I uh, noted that correctly. That's correct. Um, also correct. in the chat. Okay. Uh, and then a wide, a very wide uh, relative estimate. Um, however, um, what is most important is not the relative estimates uh, and their confidence interval, but the absolute estimates and their confidence interval. So um, we're uh, in the situation you're talking about you're talking about um, relatively small, uh, the incidence is quite low. And so the first thing that I would suggest doing in answering the question about rating down for imprecision once or twice is that we need to change those relative estimates into absolute estimates. And uh, what is it, seven over 70, um, uh, I'm a little slow in my arithmetic at the moment, but we're talking about uh, relatively small, relatively low incidence. So you're going to want to um, change that, those relative effects into absolute effects. And when the incidence is very low, what may appear as a very wide relative confidence interval may not appear uh, nearly so wide uh, when you turn it into absolute when the incidence is very low. So that would be the first thing that was, would be necessary to do. Then the next question is, um, what is the, uh, when you look at those confidence intervals in absolute, how wide are they in terms of their importance? So it may be that, and this is relating to the second question, um, can you just say there's no effect? Well, you certainly cannot say there's no effect. But the question should be, the question you should frame, I would have thought, would have been, is there an important effect? So that confidence interval, you look at both boundaries of the confidence interval and you say, what would the implications be at one end of the confidence interval? And what would the implications be at the other end of the confidence interval? And if the implications at one end, we consider that a big harm, and at the other end, a big benefit, then for sure you're going to want to rate down two for imprecision. If you look at either end of the confidence interval and you say, even though the relative is very wide, the absolute may not be so wide, well, that would only constitute a small uh, benefit at one end, small harm at the other end, then you might only rate down one. So the bottom line is for sure 
you cannot say that there is no effect, um, but you may be able to say that you've excluded an important effect, different questions. And that emphasizes more and more we're thinking that it's a crucial thing in applying grade to be very clear about what you're rating your certainty in. Maybe your certainty, you're not going to be able to be at all certain there's no effect. We're almost never able to say that. But you may be able to say you're not certain um, uh, that you are uncertain, that you may be more certain that there is uh, no important effect. Um, that that would be that would be a possibility, or at least you may you may want to say, well, there's no large effect. We're, we may be confident about that. So very careful to think about what we're rating our certainty in. Um, that's one message. Second message is um, you can't look at the relative effect when deciding on your precision rating. You need to change it into an absolute effect. Um, and Third message is when the incidence is very low, a very wide relative effect may not look um, so wide in an absolute effect. And bottom line is look at your, decide what it exactly is you're rating your certainty in uh, and look at uh, both ends of the confidence interval in deciding whether to rate down once or twice. Great, thank you, Gordon, um, and I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. Uh, I'm just sharing my, my screen again, which you should see right now. Um, there's a wonderful uh, resource that um, um, the, the training group has put together. So Chris and Dario um, and Ella, um, that um, um, again is linked to today's event. And it provides uh, all of the resources really that relate to, to, the, the, to the work of the great working group or the Cochrane Grading Methods Group. And um, specifically, um, before you look at all of the resources that are actually out there and that are well documented, um, specifically, I'll, um, to answer this question, I draw your attention to the, um, the long list of great articles. Um, we call them great guidelines, not to be confused with practice guidelines, but um, the, 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 the relevant article that um, helps you express, helps you express that particular certainty of the evidence or in the evidence and the actual effect size is hidden in grade guideline number 26, simple statements to communicate intervention effects in systematic reviews. And um, I'll pull this up um, onto my screen. This is the actual paper. And um, um, let's just assume that you there's a there's a table in here that um, makes many things clear that we were just talking about that, um, uh, um, I, again, I want to draw your attention to, um, that combines uh, um, in informative statements, we believe, in order to communicate findings, that combines both the certainty of the evidence as well as the magnitude of the effect. And let's just assume that the rating of the certainty is indeed low certainty for that example. One could argue depending on the number of events um, and um, considering the, the, the certainty, um, the, the confidence intervals around the absolute effects that you might actually rate down by two levels, um, given that there's not a large number of, of people involved and, um, and the number of events is small. But if, if we just assume that there is low certainty of the evidence, we would certainly not say, as was suggested, that there is no evidence. That would be probably not correct based on the fact that you do have uh, um, data from one randomized trial. So it's certainly no evidence, and not no evidence. And then um, if indeed, if indeed you think that there, um, as Gordon said, after you translate this into absolute effects, that there may be um, a suggestion of a moderate effect based on low certainty, this is the way that you might want to phrase this particular, that particular finding. So, um, intervention X may result in a reduction in this case in the outcome of interest um, that would be that would be um, a description or the evidence suggests um, X results in a reduction increase in the outcome. This is also a good a good test um, uh, um, a good sniff test um, for whether or not your rating is appropriate. Again, it might be appropriate to rate down for two levels um, by two levels for for imprecision given that there's only 20 events um, that you base your findings on um, and a fair, still a fairly small number of people in the trials, depends a little bit on, on the duration um, that they were followed up. If it was very low certainty of the evidence, the combination 
um, of the expression of the um, the effect size as well as the certainty um, is uh, labeled here. The evidence is very uncertain about the effect, or again, uh, it may um, decrease the actual outcome. The intervention may decrease the the um, 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 the outcome, but the evidence is very uncertain. So, just drawing your attention to these interpretation aids um, that are also integrated in the summary of findings tables. Okay. Um, perhaps uh, it would make sense to go to the to the next um, to the next question dealing with um, um, again. Um, Ella just pointed to the resources. Thanks very much. Look at the chat, please. Um, there, the the next question that we have in the chat um, is from Becky Blair. Um, specific to observational designs, are there situations when you can rate up certainty of evidence when all of the studies included in your analysis are at high risk of bias? but um, all are reporting the same direction of effect. I hope this is a clear question. I'm just learning about grade. Um, I, th I think the question is very clear. I'll start um, with a very quick answer and also alert you to the fact that in one of our next sessions, we will particularly talk about um, updates around non-randomized um, studies um, and the use of, of um, grade and non-randomized studies in Cochrane reviews. But um, the question is clear. Our um, suggestion or our guidance in GRADE is that um, if there are important concerns about risk of bias within the uh, within observational studies, so um, that's very important to clarify, concerns about risk of bias that go beyond the concerns of just the observational design. So in other words, you might find um, in case control studies important concerns about recall bias, um, or um, any other sort of bias that um, um, may further decrease your certainty in the evidence um, beyond the observational design. If that's the case, GRADE suggests to not rate up the certainty of the evidence because the simple um, um, answer to your question is these studies may all have the same bias and therefore be consistently biased um, it wouldn't increase your certainty that they are cons that they, that they are um, consistent in the presence of potential bias. So that is the quick answer to to that. And thanks, Dario, for posting this this question as well. Um, um, I'm, uh, wondering if any of my co-presenters have additional have additional um, um, questions or uh, or answers around that particular. Question. If not, then I'm going to post another um, question in the in the chat that um, my co-presenters can can also see. Um, at which point of our great assessment could we consider reproducibility of results? For example, if for an outcome we have ten different studies with a combined sample of six hundred and low inconsistency, and for another outcome, one study of 600 participants, do we, um, do we give consideration to the amount of different studies for our assessment? And the brief answer is, in, in, in grade, we do not rate up for consistent findings. We rate, rate down for inconsistent findings. Um, and it, it, it brings to the surface a very nice uh, um, feature of grade that um, the the in your second example when there's only one study when there's only one study um, there is likely going to be other concerns around the certainty of the evidence for instance around imprecision around indirectness so just think about 10 studies are more likely to be representative or applicable to different settings as opposed to a single study so um, despite the fact that on the surface it may look that a single study um, is not rated down for inconsistency and we should be treating 10 studies that show consistent results differently. The system um, in its um, gestalt approach, uh, um, the great system, accounts for um, 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 these potential um, concerns by looking at the other, other domains, but we would not rate up for consistency. Gordon, uh, um, Romina, any thoughts on that issue? Well, um, you stated it very well, Holger, and that's the key point. The only other thing in that specific example, one study of 
600 versus 10 studies of 60, um, in general, we tend to think of large studies as more trustworthy than small studies. So there's the whole phenomenon of small study effects, um, which uh, seems, unfortunately, when you have a bunch of small studies, um, historically, things have not worked out always far from it when you have a large study, which, we, which tends to be more trustworthy. And one reason for that is if those 10 studies of 60 people each were all funded by the pharmaceutical industry, we would have a real problem uh, with publication bias, which tends to be uh, more of a concern, uh, definitely more of a concern with a, a number of small studies. So um, Holger's essential point is the key one, which is we do not rate up for inconsistency. For consistency, biases may be the same across studies. Um, but in addition, uh, when thinking of a single large study versus a number of small studies, there may be other considerations that one makes actually might make one more nervous about the small studies than the one large one. Excellent. Um, thanks, Gordon. Um, I, again, um, feel free to um, um, post follow-up questions. I um, will go to the next question, and we have a lot of questions coming through, so uh, uh, I will keep my answers brief, and um, um, hopefully Gordon and Romina, um, we, we should probably do this to address as many as we can. Um, again, very quickly, next question is from Karen Steingard for test, ac and I po posted it in the chat, obviously. Um, for test accuracy reviews, is it okay to use a minimum sample size um, to guide judgments about imprecision for sensitivity and specificity? Sometimes there are a few participants contributing to the estimates of sensitivity and specificity. If yes, is there a great publication to refer to? So first answer is there is um, um, work in, um, in progress, um, in good progress, about uh, rating and precision in test accuracy studies. Uh, um, and um, um, the, the, the work focuses on thinking about optimal information size, et cetera. But um, Karen, the, the answer is probably similar to what Gordon um, provided you um, with about rating and precision in intervention studies, and that has to do with thinking about what the consequences are and how confident you are that if um, um, the true effects or true accuracy was on one side or the other side of the confidence interval, um, whether or not that would influence your, your decisions. I draw to this wonderful resource that the Cochrane team put together um, also includes other great publications. And um, one of the, the um, papers to refer to um, under other publications that helps with some of the, provide some of the answers, sorry, that um, Karen, we, we are talking about is um, the concept paper on defining the ranges um, for certainty ratings of um, test accuracy or diagnostic accuracy. So that would be the, the quick answer. And Karen, as usual, happy, very happy to, to um, 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 take follow-up questions um, on that. And also just a reminder, um, we, we, the GRADE has uh, many, many project groups that tackle these type of issues that Karen just highlighted. Um, there, um, once you sign up for the great working group, there's information for how you can participate, um, either through learning, as we said um, earlier, um, or by moving work actively forward in these project groups. Um, again, if there are other thoughts on test accuracy by my co-presenters um, here this, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you are, um, please chime in on that. Um, um, I would go to our our uh, um, next um, um, one of the next questions here. So the question is, and this will be interesting to um, discuss. Uh, and I'll I'll both Romina and 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 Gordon could could take this and. Um, uh, um, um, it refers to um, the threshold, so we that refers back to this to the informative statements, the slide that I showed there. Um, 
sorry, I didn't share my screen. Karen, I didn't share my screen on the previous answer, which I do now. So I apologize um, just very quickly. Other great publications, here it is. And um, this is where you find this information under certainty of evidence concept. So apologies for that. But the next question is, if you include the effect estimate in the informative statement, is the threshold for a small important effect similar to the clinical decision threshold? And that's an, uh, a somewhat more elaborate answer. Um, Gordon or Romina, do you want to um, um, take this first? Do you want me to address it? Um, I will very quickly, uh, and I think it was a good idea, Holger, um, that we try to be quick now, um, but you may well have something to add when I'm finished. Um, so um, the uh, small, medium, and large effects help you. Um, but they are certainly something different from a decision threshold. So for instance, you could have a, a large effect of benefit with very important downsides is different from a large effect of benefit with minimal downsides. So the, so, uh, it, it may be useful to look at the, try to uh, make decisions about small, medium, or large effects, but it's something different from the decision thresholds where you simultaneously consider the desirable and undesirable consequences of the intervention. Great, thank you, Gordon. Um, perfect, and let's perhaps go on to the, to the next question. There are so many coming and, and they're really about methods, which um, I think is so interesting and, and wonderful to us, um, as opposed to the organization of the group, which we are also happy to address. Uh, um, next question is, apologies have already discussed, um, but is there any situation when we upgrade evidence from RCTs due to effect size or dose response? And um, that's a question from Felipe Rodriguez. Um, I will take this very quickly. The general rule is that um, evidence from, so first of all, randomized controlled trials, uh, would, would upgrading would only come into place um, if there was a reason for downgrading, um, because some um, randomized controlled trials, uh, a body of evidence from randomized controlled trials provides a high certainty um, in the evidence, and only if it would be downgraded would, be, would there be a reason to, to rate up. Um, and our general rule is that you would not rate up once you have a reason for rating down um, randomized controlled trials. Now, uh, um, um, our, our general guidance, um, um, should not be um, interpreted as dogma. Um, there are certainly scenarios that you can imagine where the magnitude of the effect would balance concerns that you have around one of the domains where you would rate down. So for instance, think about um, uh, extrapolation when you have concerns about directness um, of, the, of the population or indirectness um, of the population, you're extrapolating from an older population to a younger population, but um, the effects are extremely large. Um, you have, for instance, relative risk reductions of 80%. Um, these type of considerations would, would um, um, certainly moderate your concerns about indirectness with the extrapolation if there is no good reason to believe that there is an interaction between the age of the population and the actual um, intervention effects. And even if there was some interaction um, the effects may not be as large, but they may still be large, and it, would, it could potentially mitigate concerns about indirectness. So as opposed to rating down and then rating up, one way of thinking about it is when you took, take all of the domains together, is it really necessary to rate down for indirectness um, 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 when you extrapolate, when you have very large effects? And that was the question that came from Philippe. Uh, um, 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 great question. I would go Just to the next. Can I just add one little thing here? There's perhaps an irony here. In randomized GSA, large effects we may rate up. On the other hand, we're skeptical of large effects in randomized trials based on small numbers. And when you see it, we say, watch out. And in fact, that's where the optimal information size comes from. So very, very, very seldom are we going to rate up for uh, large effects, if ever, within randomized trials. Okay, great. And um, unfortunately, the best sessions have come to an end. Um, um, I'm saying this ironically, but uh, we are really about four minutes from the end of this first session. So first of all, a reminder, there are additional sessions throughout the day. 
and we will be addressing these type of questions that we've been um, talking about here. Um, we'll keep note of the questions that were, there's three additional questions that we didn't um, address necessarily here, but um, um, one of the things that we, that we wanted to go through, and I asked um, Gordon and Romina and then myself um, to take 30 seconds or so to answer, um, the big question is really in order to uh, um, um, make sure that you, that you all um, understand and agree um, um, what this grading methods group is about and, and um, um, how exciting it is to join, um, the question is really to be addressed in 30 seconds. Um, if you want, um, what has kept you involved in, in Cochrane's work for so many, year, so many years? And I'll start with Gordon. If you want to turn Thanks, on your video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Holger. Um, yeah, I've been involved since the beginning, so it's a long time. Um, and what's kept me involved is the excitement of this group, uh, the methods group um, for uh, that's become the grading methods group. I'm also one of the co-conveners of the patient reported outcomes ah. group. And what's been wonderful for me is to be able to contribute to Cochrane um, uh, in the methods area through co-convening these two groups. Thanks, Gordon. Um, Romina? Thanks, Holger. Um, I, I am involved because I believe that if what you do is related with evidence synthesis and in particular with systematic reviews, you have to be in Cochrane to stay updated, to learn what's going on. Uh, and it's good not only for yourself, your career and all the things you do outside Cochrane, but also when you teach because you, you teach your students what the state of the art is and, and everyone is doing better reviews inside and outside of Cochrane. Great, thank you, Romina. Um, you hear, you heard that, and um, I'll just add my 30 seconds. So, uh, and beyond what was already said, um, Cochrane is really the the the, um, the the mecca for methods development and evidence synthesis. Um, beyond um, that point, I think it's a network of people. Cochrane is a is a great great community that is large, that is international in focus. Um, I hope that very soon we can meet in in person again. Um, the next um, Cochrane specific colloquium will be in 2022 in Toronto um, that we will be hosting. And um, it's those type of events that also um, make this work so worthwhile. Um, the creation of networks, the work with colleagues, we um, um, support people around the world um, in creating summary of findings tables, which we really hope um, improve the, the delivery of care and um, decision making by the relevant individuals. Um, and only Cochrane can really achieve that.